Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on your lunch break with One Bookshelf. This week is Dungeon Masters Guild Community Jam, and we are talking all about D&D duets with, this way, this way, with the D&D duet folks, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, we'll get into what exactly that means, but let's kick this off with some introductions. If this is your first time tuning in, hello, my name is Lisa Penrose. I am the brand manager for Dungeon Masters Guild, which is a marketplace where you can find goodness every fifth edition uh, d and um, additional new rules, player options, adventures that you could possibly imagine, or if it's not there, uh, you can even create your own. Um, Beth, introduce yourself. Ooh, one moment. I did not check audio levels. Properties, are we pulling the right thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now introduce yourself. Okay. There we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Beth Ball. I'm one of the two writers behind d d Duet. Um, I'm also a fantasy novelist and a literary scholar. And Jonathan. Yes, I'm Jonathan Ball. I'm the other half of d d Duet. And when I'm not writing or daydreaming about d d stuff, I am uh, teaching. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's start off um, and sort of contextualize y'all's journey in Dungeons and Dragons for folks. How did you discover D and D? Oh goodness. Um, so Dungeons and Dragons was one of those things that I knew as a kid that I was going to love if I ever got bitten until I was twenty eight or something. Um, but I started playing with a little group of friends um, that, uh, you know, we're just doing some home. I got a like I got into it hard. Uh, I just remember, you know, coming home and pouring over the PHB and, um, you know, gushing over all the art. And uh, I would just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it to my lovely wife. <laughs> Um, just heads up, uh, Jonathan, I think your audio is cutting in and out um, just a couple times. We got we definitely got most of what you said um, for folks at home. You know, what? we're just grateful. Beth and Jonathan were able to first have power and Internet to join us. So thank you for your patience. We'll manage we'll manage around this. Um, and Beth, what about you? So he had been playing D&D for a year before I decided that it, I would give it a try. I was positive I would not like d and I thought there were going to be too many rules and that it would be this like stressful thing. And he's like, no, it's about stories. You love stories. I'm like, okay, we can try. And then I loved it. Um, and so the way I started playing was just the two of us really. I'd done one other session that he DM'd in a, in a really small group. And I love playing, um, it, especially just the two of us. And that was what really... I think sparked my interest the most is he had put so much work into designing this campaign for me, helped me design a character. And I thought that was really special and fun. And it kind of rolled on from there. So your experience with Dungeons and Dragons really is anchored in this duet experience. So for folks at home who've never, who've only ever played D&D in more traditional ways, what is a D&D &D duet? So it's when you have one DM and one player, and then you're a duet. And we like duet more than like solo, since solo you can be by yourself. And the there are some like playery aspects of being the DM in a duet, and some DM-ish aspects of being a player. And so we'd like to emphasize that co-creative nature of playing in a duet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, do you remember? Um when you were playing that first D D adventure when what moment like where it clicked with you where you were like oh i actually really love this the first adventure was um the first adventure was really fun it was like a couple of sessions in where things like really really clicked for me and it was like when my character started connecting with his dmpc and i was like oh this is amazing, but it took a bit for me to understand that I could like 
add things into the world and I wasn't going to mess anything up and and to understand the mechanics a little bit so um to to figure out like this is the thing that I want my character to do and here's how I can help her do that and so once those two things got balanced and I started relating to and getting to talk to his character it was I was sold from there that's the magic of Dungeons and Dragons yeah yeah that was a big revelation for me too. Like the first time that I conceptualized of it um, with just the two of us, I had this DMPC who I didn't know was a DMPC. And I imagine him as kind of just popping out to help her fight almost like Pokeball style. <laughs> like all of a sudden I'm here. And then I thought he was going to be like riding around in her amulet for the majority of the time. And she would be, I don't know, like running around talking to herself or something. It took a long, it took a few sessions for me to realize like, oh, we need to actually be interacting. He's <laughs> a new DM too. So mm-hmm. I mean, there was lots of learning going on. Um, So let's sort, well, actually before I was going to ask about sort of the, the, uh, the challenges of writing duets, but before that, what took you from this being a home game to wanting to publish uh, on Dungeon Masters Guild? For me, it was seeing so many people asking for help on Reddit or something like that, that they wanted to play one-on-one. And then I we kept seeing responses like, no, you need to find a group to play with. And that just got to me because I was like, no, this person needs help they just want to like they have somebody they want to play with they don't need a whole group and um and once our website kind of got going and um he had written or he had kind of outlined that first adventure that i that i ran through that kind of taught me how to play and he's like we could just put this up on dm's guild we'll outline it it'll be fine it'll help people and we'll just kind of go from there wait is that first blush Oh, that was your first adventure. That's really cool because I've played that with my now husband, uh, then boyfriend, uh, ran it for him. Uh, so it's it's kind of cool having that shared experience. So what are the challenges of writing and running a duet adventure? I think one of the things about uh, writing a duet adventure is... Um, I don't know. For me, I feel like in a duet, the NPCs and like the role play elements need to be a little bit more three dimensional than they would necessarily need to be in a group setting because you don't have, you know, the diverse characters of a large party there to add flavor and context to what's going on. Um, And so kind of trying to focus on how how you can make your NPCs a little bit more interesting and a little bit deeper. Uh, is one of the things that I think adds something to a duet adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Beth? I would add too that the, sometimes the scale or the mechanics, because it can be so different if you even, I mean, maybe even especially at lower levels, if we've got like a level three or level five wizard and versus a barbarian, they're going to need kind of different setups. The mechanics of the, creature and PC, whatever they're fighting is going to be really different. And so how you can kind of help DMs personalize things for and encourage that personalization, because the one on one method of playing depends so much on things being oriented around the PC. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, I've definitely found in the duet games that Dusty and I have played, it is really different from a group setting because um, for example, when, as like Jonathan then mentioned, when you're interacting with an NPC, it's just two people talking to each other. So the attention is very much just on that one aspect of this conversation. And role play can kind of get a lot deeper if that's a, a pillar of play that you're really interested in. Um, how do you guide that as someone trying to write for DMs to have this tool set? Like you mentioned, Jonathan, that NPCs have to have a little bit more depth or be more interesting. Um, How do you go about that? I don't know. I I think that one of the things that you can emphasize in those cases is um, 
kind of centering a couple of things like what do you want this npc to do like what's their function in the adventure um and then how can you write the npc's motivations like what is this npc trying to get out of this experience right um and kind of leaning into making sure that that's clearly articulated in the adventure if you're writing a one-on-one -on -one adventure mm -hmm. what do you think honey i um i definitely think that those two things i you know i think you said it really perfectly i don't know that i have something very <laughs> profound to to add we kind of stumbled upon the um in first blush listing like the the flaw motivation those sorts of things and that's been really helpful for us to have that kind of there for the dm but thinking about why does the, what's driving this character why do they need the pc's help why can't they do it by themselves and how are they going to kind of help the pc navigate in this new setting or wherever it is that they are without being so uh, I don't know, gregarious in their personality or something that they're going to kind of mow over the PC. How do you keep the PC in the spotlight? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a duet adventure, not a solo adventure for the Dungeon Master. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more about First Blush. Now that I know that that was like the actual first adventure that you all wrote, what was the process uh, like writing that? Um Especially, I'm interested, Jonathan, and in, you were running these duet adventures. How did you, how was it different getting it down on paper for others to run? Uh, I don't know. Well, I like many, like I think a lot of newbie DMs, when I first wrote the adventure, I over planned and over wrote. And so when it was time to kind of adapt it into something for other people, um, I found that I had way more material to work from than I had originally planned. Uh, with First Blush, I wanted to have an adventure where uh, it was going to be the first time that Beth was playing a character. And so I wanted to have a an adventure that kind of showcased in a safe place um, the role play, a little bit of um, exploration and a little bit of combat. And then to put everything all together in like a little mini dungeon. And um, I don't know, that that worked really well for uh, putting that together on a one shot, I think, And mm -hmm. at the end of the day. What was your process like, Beth? It was definitely... Oh, no, please. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, sorry. It was definitely interesting. I, I, just real quickly. Um, it was definitely interesting trying to... Because like your dm notes are for you and they can be as messy or nonsensical as they can be and it was a really interesting process converting something that was you know for my eyes only for um public consumption because you you can't take anything for granted and you still have to be um concise you know it, you don't need a one shot that is fifty thousand words long right um then it's it's probably not going to be a one shot so like, what can you anticipate <laughs> what can you not anticipate where, where do you need to go into more detail where do you need less detail and it's a process like we we learn from every adventure that we write mm -hmm. okay I'm done. <laughs> there's definitely that aspect of when you're learning to write and design adventures learning where you can and letting learning and letting go in such a way that you like trust the dungeon master that's going to use this, um, that they are you're giving them enough thread uh, to to work with, um, but that they are going to weave that story with their players. Uh, what was the experience and process like for you, Beth? So for first blush, I got kind of the. Uh, a midway along draft and helped with the revision and adding to it as well as asking some questions of like, okay, if I were running this, here's where I would be a little bit lost at this moment, or how can we add some things back in here and make it moving between the different pieces? How can we make that a little bit easier? And so that, um, that one, I had a little bit more of an editorial role and then it was second glance. So the one that comes after that, I did the kind of, the spearheading of and for my first adventure i just kind of started at where are we beginning and then kind of went 
from there instead of I I didn't have really a, an outline or a plan I just kind of discovered as we went along and so that adventure kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> It's really cool to um, being part of a pair, you know, like as D and D duet, we like Beth is such an incredible creative writer period, but also like, she's so good with detail and editing. And that is not my strong suit, right? <laughs> like, I, I think I'm, one of my strengths is like the, the game design element of it. But as far as like, if I didn't have, if we weren't part of a pair and if she, if we didn't have complimentary strengths, then I don't know how many we would have written. <laughs> <laughs> and you all have written a bunch of duets uh, at this point. I, I have a vast library of, of really different like environments and types of stories that you're telling. Um, just a, like a quick thing I want to mention before I forget is that it's really interesting hearing about both of you mentioning like the scope of what you were writing, but then also trying to pare it down and edit it down. Um, I mentioned this in, um, I just recently did a stream where my husband and I played one of your duet adventures, Frozen Deaths, and um, he had to go get his charging cord for his laptop at one point. And so I'm like vamping about duets. Um, and I mentioned that one thing I really like about um not just duet adventures as a genre, but your specifically D and D duets is that they're really great for date night because you keep them pretty succinct. Um, Frozen Depths was ten pages with the cover and the open gaming license at the end, so like eight pages of prep. Um, and uh, but I feel like you give me lots of like little things that I can use to to tell the story, lots of tools, um, and. Uh, I think that's one of the great things because it's also very low key. You want to just grab one other person and play some Dungeons and Dragons. You can really enjoy it. Um, so tell me about your latest duet adventure and then go into how that process differs from your first one, First Blush. Oh, no one wants to interrupt. Oh, we- Beth, you <laughs> tag your in. <laughs> I'm it. Um, so I have two that are in process right now. Um, one of them has that same problem where it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, it's coming to DM Guild soon-ish. Um, it will be called Feywild Foray. It's going to be so much fun. Um, I really, I have the, I made the cover for myself so I could like kind of spur my energy along. <laughs> um, but so that one, I have more like, I, I think now that I've been designing adventures for a bit, I can kind of see the nodes and chapters. So it's more about getting that down in such a way that it's going to be easy for people to follow. And I have been trying to be more flexible in like, okay, how are we getting around this adventure or this place? And that structural, um, the I, I'm more of a nodal thinker. And so then taking something that I need to be open and sandboxy and then communicating it in a linear way without making it linear is I get a little stuck at that point every single time I'm designing an adventure but it's like one of those little blocks that you just have to kind of run into and then pop over and then you'll be fine Mm -hmm. Jonathan anything to add I think also yeah I I mean one of our big projects that we've continuing that, that we're continuing to work on too is uh one-on-one vampire campaign um, that we've been kind of chipping away at with the uh, with our patrons, and um, that's been really exciting. It's it's the biggest thing. It, it will end up being certainly the biggest thing that we've ever put together. Um, but it's it's an interesting and new challenge to have something that's more than kind of a one-off. That things are linked together, and we get to explore a little bit more, like the region, the history, the lore, um, and go into a little bit more depth. That's been fun. really cool. Uh, so what are, would you say, lessons you've learned along the way of writing all of and designing all these duet adventures? Um, this is sort of like a great question. Like if you just have tips for people who are watching who want to design duet adventures as well, what would be your top tips? One of mine is, and it it could be our audience specifically, but I I really think it's part of 
the kind of duet community as a whole, we have a lot of new DMs coming in. So it's a really easy way for people to get started. And so keeping that in mind as a designer, um, and, and it's also even some people who have been DMing, it's an easy way to bring somebody else in, especially if you're bringing somebody into a group, it can be really nice to just have the one-on-one -on -one experience to, so they can get kind of used to it. And so adding in some tips and being really clear about how you've scaled things. Are you assuming they have a DMPC? Are you not? Um, those sorts of details for the DMs, I think are, I, I'm sure they're important all the time. I think they're extra important in the one-on-one -on -one adventures because it, at least for us, we have so many new DMs kind of coming, uh, coming into the adventures. And sometimes they want just a little bit of reassurance and as well as a little bit of extra guidance. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of bouncing off of that too, um, we also have been doing more as the longer that we write, I think that we do more noting options for scaling things. Um, so, you know, here's an option for if you are running around with the DMPC and, you know, you've picked up the NPC and they're helping and involved, right? Or, you know, here's an option for if the PC is just solo, um, I feel like a huge part of running a duet is adapting things kind of on the fly. You, you've had this experience like in mm -hmm. the, in the one-on-one -on -one games that you've run where, um, oh gosh, well, that was a critical hit. Like, um, and then there's a healing potion. Right? Like, <laughs> I mean, that's part of it. And, um, making that easier for DMS to, uh, just kind of grab and throw into their game is something that we've been, doing more and more of as we've been writing. Mm -hmm. Ashenworks has a great question that leads sort of, you started mentioning what it's like running a duet adventure. Ashenworks asks, what do you think of streaming slash podcasting a duet game? What would be different compared to a private game? Great question. Yeah, do do they mean for, um, like what do we think about if somebody else were, were streaming a game? Um, I mean, I think they, they're asking in general, but also you two do stream uh, a duet game. So uh, feel free to, to talk about that a little bit um, for folks who might be interested in uh, observing and learning about a duet by, by watching a stream. Um, and then tell us a little bit about what, what you've learned from those experiences. So I DM our Tales of Eldura game, and it's so much fun. Um, but it started as a remix of Descent into Avernus, and then um, I took the story just in a, we're going a new direction. So I just, anyway, we, we put Descent into Avernus to the side a little bit. So I just kind of borrowed the stat blocks and things. Um, it's been so much fun. I think the key for, especially if you are designing the the stream or the the adventures that you'll be running whether it's for a stream or for a podcast is the story really is about the pc and so you are you know your katniss in the hunger games or you are running things for katniss in the hunger games is not lord of the rings and that's i think the biggest difference is the focus is on this one character and so make sure that the player has that space to make the story about themselves and and grow and those sorts of things. And I think as long as you can do that, if you can get people kind of connected with the character and have a complimentary person for them to run around with or two, if you really want, um, then I think you'll be, then I think you'll be set. Mm -hmm. I think another difference too is like when you're playing a, like a private game, we've been playing one-on-one -on -one D and D for two years, three years. Three years. So we've been playing for three years and, you know, this persistent campaign every weekend, you know, oftentimes twice a week. Um, it, it the, the big difference for me is that there isn't, you're playing for an audience, right? And so one of the cool things about playing one-on-one -on -one versus playing at a group game for me is like, if I do something weird as the DM or if I'm like, Duh, then the something I don't know, right? Like I can just say, um, we're just gonna take a pause, you know, like let's refresh our beverages and get a snack and then we'll come back and play. It's much easier to kind of just 
call a call a, a timeout, right? Like if you're um, playing a private game, but uh, you know, Beth DMing our streaming game has the added challenge of, you know, you're you're playing it for an audience, and we don't have that kind of ease of well let's take a pause let's talk about this right like let's figure this out that was weird what i'm trying to say is right like <laughs> mm -hmm. there's there's a little bit less of that if you're playing for an audience mm -hmm. what other tips do you all have for just running a duet in general and uh tips for that like adjusting on the fly especially since that's so important in a duet game i think one of the things is trusting your partner and the person that you're playing with that they're going to be bringing things to the table too. And then keeping situations as open as possible so that they have the space to kind of do what their character is wanting to do. And and then you're kind of figuring out the solutions together instead of like, okay, this is the one way to solve this problem. And so then you as the DM, like you're not holding it behind the screen. You're working with the other person to figure out this problem that you've also created. But if you don't know the answer, then I think it makes it easier to to have a conversation as your characters and figure things out. And then the, I, I know we said this earlier, but having a DMPC, whether that's a full character or a sidekick or whatever you want to do, I think is really, really helpful so that the PC has somebody to talk to and hang out with. I think it's more immersive. Okay. Yeah. We went through several, this is kind of a, branching off of that a little bit but like we went through several iterations of trying to figure out how exactly we wanted um the various characters or dmpcs to work and so initially beth had a full character sheet and um i did the role playing for the dmpc and she ran like a simplified stat block and we went we started there and got more and more complicated to where we had you know a essentially a full party of full character sheets in a binder. And we were like flipping through and um, it got more complicated, but where we've kind of ended up is back at where we, you know, used to be like, I have a DM PC with a full character sheet. She has her PC with a character sheet. And most of the time our parties now are, you know, to the two characters and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of ex explored and, played around with, you know, having a bigger group or a smaller group with just the two of us and ended up kind of streamlining things a little bit. I think you got to figure out what works for you. Yeah. I um it's interesting that you mentioned that cuz Doug in Texas has a question. Do you recommend using sidekicks with duet adventures um or do they tend to be better with just a solo PC? I think sidekicks are wonderful. Um and and so like my PC in our home game right now, I have her character sheet and a sidekick, and he's a pretty chill, simplified character sheet that works really well with hers. And so we have, um, we use some of the sidekick rules that kind of came out recently, and then we've added some things or some abilities to them, whereas like a character might have, um, you know, at level four, you get the you can get a feat. So we've basically been, we've been playing with some sidekick feats. What would that look like? And I think that the nice thing about sidekicks for me narratively is that it brings the, the combat together in a really, in a really interesting and cohesive way where you have these characters who are used to fighting together. And so kind of, I don't know, I feel like the sidekick mechanics help bring that, maybe bring that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Oh. We've been having a lot of fun with uh, the, the sidekick feat, right? Like, what would be really useful for a sidekick character to be able to do that a normal character wouldn't be able to necessarily do? Um, so, like, one of our favorites is uh, Beth's, Beth's sidekick character right now has, like, strategic reposition. And so he's very tanky, and he can, you know, as a bonus action, I think, like, get to her and then switch spots with her if she's gotten in over her head, which she often does um, to kind of, you know, tank that damage. That's, that's coming in. so perfect for a duet game because those are the sorts of moments that come up where you need to adjust on the fly. Um, so I feel like 
that you you both in he, listening to you both there's two reasons why sidekicks or dmpc are useful one is just mechanically um they act as sort of like a buffer to that one pc being like really squishy so mechanically they're really helpful but also beth mentioned that they add more role playing possibilities they give someone someone to talk to they make the experience more immersive um i feel like in the games i've played with my husband um, I've leaned really hard on that second point, giving him something to interact with. So his character is a rug salesman uh, of disrepute. So he has a pet rug of smothering uh, who follows him around. And in one other adventure uh, from Eyes Unclouded, he picked up a baby mimic who's usually shaped like a teacup. Um, uh, and so I... I guess I also really like role-playing NPCs who aren't humanoids, but actually kind of objects and figuring out how they would interact. Um, so it gives him lots of opportunities to interact and such. But uh, before this call, I was telling Beth and Jonathan about the recent adventure I played of theirs, Frozen Depths. Um, and uh, he didn't uh, heal between combats. And so in the final combat, um, I was rolling really well. And like he just went down and I'm like, oh, like... I kind of wish I had a DMPC with healing spells um, because now the game's just over. Uh, there ended up being another character in the room who I ended up giving a healing spell because they were a mage. Um, uh, but I can see where having like a constant companion like that who has strategic reposition or other helpful skills um, would really uh, be useful uh, in those sorts of situations. Um are there any moments uh, that come up for you where uh, it's really memorable, but it came from needing to kind of adjust on the spot? I have one that was so cool. Okay, so my character is like best friend, favorite companion. They're in this like huge fight with this dragon. It was like the biggest boss fight that we've had. And um, she had already been revivified, so like we're we're low on HP. It was like first thing, dragon just took her out. So anyway, we got revivified, so that was good. Um, he fell to zero HP, and then the dragon rolled like three nat ones in a row, and so Jonathan ruled like Ignis, which is his, his titan mute. Ignis comes in and kind of rescues this character because I was trying, I was you know petrified that he's going to die i didn't have another way to bring him back um but and then immediately after he rolled like very literally three nat 20s and so it was crazy um and so you know jonathan's so good at um illustrating combat especially based on the roles so when you have something super epic like three nat 20s um i was like ah! um, <laughs> flash off one of the dragon's wings and it's you know it's this really epic thing but this super immediate very dramatic turn of events with between and it's in the the one round of combat the dragon went and then he went it was it was wild oh man sometimes the dice just know uh and they make the story so epic <laughs> what about you jonathan anything come to mind oh i don't know like they're I do a lot of on the fly adjusting. I think it's like, I'm, I'm a little bit of a lazy prepper. And so um, I'll just like grab something. I'm like, probably this will work fine. Uh, and then we get into it and it's like, oh goodness. Or, you know, it's like, well, this isn't really a challenge. Probably this will be fine. An ogre zombie enters the fray. Oh no, everybody's dead. Um, so I don't know. There. I tend to play a little fast and loose with uh, like what's you know on the stat block, and um, I'm always trying to prioritize like what's going to be the most fun thing to happen while still making it feel as weighty as possible. Um, and I don't know, there are I, I think I think Beth stole the one that I would probably use. Um, just like. Hard and to top critical... three nat ones and three nat twenties in succession. <laughs> and for critical rolls like that too, I we always make it a point to like roll on the table so both of us can see. So like those three nat ones happened, you know, openly, and those three nat twenties happened openly, and that just makes it you know that even better. dials it up. Yeah, that's really cool. 
Oh, wow. Truly epic. I feel like like my heart feels that <laughs> like the adrenaline. <laughs> um, uh, I'm coming up on the the nearing the end of my list of prepared questions. So I also want to make sure I call out to folks in chat uh, that if you have any questions about um, duet adventures, writing them, uh, running them, um, or questions about Beth and Jonathan's experience publishing on Dungeon Masters Guild and Drive Through RPG, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, put question in all caps if you can uh, at the top of that, and that makes it easy to see those questions and for our wonderful moderator Meredith to grab those uh, and send those to me. Um, all right, so. Um, you both actually have a show, another resource for folks who want to run uh, Duet Adventures. Uh, can you tell me what is that called and tell me a little bit about it? Okay. Uh, it's <laughs> cute. Um, so <laughs> on Fridays, uh, we have a show on Twitch called Tabletop for Two where we talk about um, running duet games and some of our experiences uh, with like best practices and um, just kind of sharing what has worked for us. Like we spent, we spent a lot of time playing one-on-one -on -one D and D and we've done a lot of trial and error and we've made a lot of mistakes and we've learned a lot. And um, so it's kind of an outlet for us to share the things that have worked for us uh, best and some some kind of considerations to uh, think about too. So, mm -hmm. uh, Does each, do you go in with um, specific themes or topics for each episode? What have been some themes and topics in the past? So each episode has its own, its own theme and we do that for like the first 45 minutes or so and then try to open it up for more general questions and so we've really just gotten the show started this year but we talked about running a date night duet we talked about some adding in some different character types and kind of what that can look like specifically in one-on-one -on -one D, D. our first episode was on do we do we just talk about like running duets in general and now i'm blanking i'm we blanking special, too okay <laughs> we got a special request for talking about running D&D &D with kids one-on-one. -on -one. Oh. And this is an area that if you are out there and you're running a duet with your child or would be interested in running a duet with your child, I think this is such a huge area that, like, you know, we don't have kids, but we're, we're happily child-free. Uh, we have dogs. They don't usually play. I would love to see more people writing one-on-one -on -one or even one-on-two adventures for parents and their kids. We have um, several of our patrons, plenty of people we talk to in the community play with their kids, but I just think that that is an under-tapped or under-resourced area specifically for game designers. I would love to see more stories that are written with children in mind. And there are a few titles like that already on DM Skilled, but you know, we, I don't have a way to test those out, you know? And so mm -hmm. that, I think that would be so cool to see. So just, just throwing that out there while we're all here, uh, I think that would be awesome. I feel like I love hearing about kids playing D and D in general, although I think I've only ever heard of it as kids playing it in a group or a whole family, a one-on-one -on -one adventure. What a great way for a kid to get a lot of attention um, from their parent um, mm -hmm. in a really wonderful setting and activity. And I feel like it becomes even easier for if like a kid is struggling with a particular challenge or like a social interaction in the game to hit pause um, and then just talk about it as a parent with your kid. Um, that would be cool. Uh, but the also uh, no no children to just like conceptually uh, that seems really cool to me. <laughs> if there's anyone in chat who plays D and D with their kids, would love for you to to chime in um, with your firsthand experience. Um, do you want? Can you give us a little taste of what one can expect from the show? Like, tell us a little bit about um, say that date night uh, date night episode. What sort of topics do you delve into in that? So for our date night episode, we, I don't know, that's the biggest thing for duet D&D &D for Beth and I is like, it's a such a wonderful way to spend time together. And 
it's amazing to spend time creating and telling stories with the person that is special to you and like near and dear to your heart. Um, and we do, we've kind of done a lot to um, explore ways to make those nights even more special, right? Like, so um, we're big fans of uh, like cantrip candles, for example, like to set the mood and um, we do like fancy food and we'll, you know, like uh, make rations or whatever, made all the more easy by the new cookbook that I can't wait to try out. Um, and, you know, like, how can you take this and make it a special event and um, just kind of play together? It's it's really fun to um, be sitting across from somebody who, um, if it's a date night, you know, like you might already be uh, romantically involved with and to kind of flirt with them as different people. Like, and, you know, if you're playing a persistent campaign, you know, you can even watch because our characters are oftentimes aspects of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of re-fall in love with the person that you're in love with again and again. It's it's incredibly special. And it's been very rewarding for um, our relationship and our marriage. It's it's just awesome. I think I think I think that everybody should do it. So <laughs> what about you, Beth? Um, in that episode, we also talked about ways for, like, if you are the, the player in a duet, whether it's a romantic date night or maybe it is, like, parent and kid, what are some other ways that you can get involved as the player? And so one of my favorite things to do, if I know the, if we're kind of leading up to a pivotal session, I love to create special playlists for those sessions. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, a really fun way for me to kind of get into my character's head and think about setting the mood and those sorts of things for um, there's a ball and then we're going to have this heist or maybe we need really epic battle music and I want to kind of add on to the list that Spotify already has and so then I make that list and so kind of bouncing off some of those ideas so that way you're taking things that you're already interested in that are fun for you and adding that to the table so that there's not quite so much on on the DM shoulders. And and that made me think of too, thinking about streaming, whether it's a podcast or a video, when you are doing a, a duet for an audience, it, it's already hard enough to take notes when you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, but you kind of especially can't when you're playing together for other people. And so, and there's not really a break. So I can't, as the DM, pay attention to what his character is saying and be leaving myself lots of really profound notes for later and so i think that that's one of the maybe that's just a, like a nerdy challenge on my part because i really like <laughs> taking notes and then it's like oh i can't write that. i just have to kind of leave myself little scribbles but i think as the dm being prepared to kind of sub in and help the player if they get stuck on a name so they're not having to flip and find it or for yourself you coming up with some sort of a shorthand or a little baby note and then leaving yourself notes for future sessions can be really helpful and i don't think that's something i thought about before we started our stream and then it's just become clearer and clearer to me of kind of how do I have these little things ready to go and so I have like a list of names that if, in case he needs it I have them right there and and or I, if I need them then they're right there and so that kind of easily easily reference things so it's not like let me find that and then 20 minutes later there it is yeah it's a really really nice way to make up for the fact that I'm not a good note taker at the table like on like stream or no stream that's not one of my strengths but um i was just thinking about that too that's another great uh like duet tip is um outsourcing aspects of prep to your player and inviting them to be more involved like honey when you took over our playlist at the table it was like one less thing that i had to think about and it got so much better than it would have been um and that's just really helpful. And there are other things too, like, um, you know, feel free to ask your player uh, if they're familiar with a town, then, you know, have them describe aspects of that town that you can then build off of. I love that so many of these tips are about 
sort of elevating the, ex I mean, it is elevating the experience, but just making the experience of that session even more immersive. Um, but also a lot of what you mentioned are things that the player can help with, the DM can help with. If you're cooking a meal, you can do that together. And it's like prepping for this epic session of gaming becomes part of the date night uh, itself. Um, or, uh, uh, or I guess it's like, especially in these times where it's difficult to be out there go going and doing other activities, making something more immersive and kind of transporting you to this fantasy world uh, becomes even more special. Um, I feel like I had a question before I asked Doug in Texas's question, but I've forgotten. So that question must have been a lie. Um <laughs> Um, oh, if I remember it, I'll jump back to it. But Doug in Texas does have a question for you all. Have you found the need to modify non-combat aspects of adventure design when writing a duet adventure compared to a standard adventure? I think so. Um, one of the things that we figured out early on was that it made sense to have Beth's player character be the one doing the majority of the talking and so we had to give her a reason to be like the front person, even if she was uh, like in our game, she's traveling around with like a thousand year old warrior from a previous time or something, right? Like she might not be the most experienced, but we gave her a reason to be the voice piece for the party. Um, and so that's, that's one consideration. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you said that because I think that that's super important because you don't want a situation where the DM is having to talk to themselves. Um, and so it, whenever you can avoid that is is good. And that's something we talked about on the blog some is kind of trying to find that balance between the, you know, the storyline is about the PC, but what happens if you were playing a more introverted PC who's walking around with a really extroverted NPC do you as the player, like it's a, it's okay if they're talking to somebody, you can switch, or maybe they're in some sort of a role, like Jonathan was just saying, there, where there's a reason for the PC to be the person doing the talking. And so finding some way for the NPC to kind of defer to the PC without it being, um, it, if the player gets stuck, don't feel, don't be afraid to help them if they're not really sure. And I think there are lots of different ways of getting stuck in D, D in general, but I, I think that that's, I worry that DMs are going to lean more toward being like, too withdrawn instead of rolling over their player. I feel like that's going to happen. To me, that seems less likely to happen. Um, another thing that I would add that's kind of adjacent to that, especially like giving the PC a reason to be the person making the decisions. One of the things that we did in our very first campaign was I, I paired, like I had two DMPCs or people traveling around basically with the character, and one is very lawful, and very honorable and wants to do the right thing, and the other one, is just trying to get from point A to point B, and if hilarity ensues, all the better, right? And so oftentimes, you know, Beth's character would go to them for advice one gives them the you know like this is the this is the way that we do things according to the rules right and the other person's like what if we all put on hats and started you know i don't know dancing to distract the whatever right and so she is in a position then to be like the tie break tie yeah tie breaking vote in a, a pair of suggested plans or to find a way to bring those two together uh, or come up with her own plan and, you know, kind of be the person that makes the decision. So that's another thing that we did. That's awesome. Very much that sort of angel and devil on the shoulder uh, dynamic. That's fun. Uh, I also want to call out in chat this comment by Ketra. Uh, my first time DMing D&D &D was with one of their adventures, and I really enjoy continuing it with my hubby. Uh, that's very sweet. Thank you for sharing that you uh, uh, that it was your first time DMing as well. Uh, that's quite cool. Uh, so um, I'm wondering, are there any questions I didn't ask you uh, that you would or topics I didn't ask you about that you'd love to chime in on or just general wisdoms you want to share that you didn't get to in your other answers? 
I have one for thinking about PCs and one-on-one play. Um, one of the things we like to do for our characters that I recommend for, especially home games that I don't know, I haven't yet found like the best way to put it into adventures when you're publishing them, but make the PC, tweak them to where they're a little bit special or fancy for where they would normally be for their class is is one thing as, or like that class and level, maybe give them a magical item that would be more powerful than you might give to a PC in a party, but it's still going to help them. And also think about how can you increase the character's flexibility? So if, if you're playing a ranger, maybe you're set up normally to be really good at ranged things, make sure they have something that can help them navigate a melee situation just so the the player has that flexibility and you as a as the dm i think that makes the dm's job easier too is if the if the character has this flexibility and their problem solving that's going to help you out a lot too but i think it's important to keep in mind that there's not that balancing factor of the party kind of swooping in to help maybe it's just, especially if it's just the the pc and their sidekick if the sidekick can't get there, the PC needs to at least be able to leave or something. Mm-hmm. I love that thought that um, uh, that you can give the player items or features or what have you that you wouldn't give others because they are the chosen one of this story. Like you said, it's not Lord of the Rings. They are they are Katniss Everdeen. Um, and I wonder, it would be cool to give them a weapon that's sentient so that it kind of acts as a DMPC um, and maybe has features that just the personality in the weapon can activate uh, as sort of uh, that emergency red button uh, that you, that the DM sometimes has to hit. Uh, that'd be fun. But that's just me wanting to role play objects some more. So <laughs> I was going to call you out on it. <laughs> um, any other so wisdoms funny. you wanted to touch on, Jonathan? Um. I think that, well, I, I mean, I would just encourage people, if you're thinking about writing something for DMs Guild, it's such an incredibly rewarding experience um, to pour yourself into something and to, um, you know, kind of have that experience of putting something that you really care about out there. And in that same vein, um, Beth and I talk about this all the time, but like, you know, we have things that we love to write and like themes that we like to hit. And, you know, a lot of our stuff is very naturey and druidy and there are going to be, you know, don't be surprised if there are fey foxes all of a sudden or like cute little, you know, like put in the things that you love um, and don't be afraid to lean into that. Do you want to say more about that, honey? Um. I, I love what you said. I was just thinking about how much we've learned since we first published First Blush versus now. Like we just put out a really big revision of it at the end of last year. And I kind of went back and forth. Like, do we want to go back and revise this? Do we want to just leave it as is? Um, but we have so many people play it and 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 get it and everything. We're like, no, we want this to be as good as it can be because it is such a such a nice way to help people get started with their with their one-on-one -on -one game. And it's such a special adventure to us too. Um, but we've gotten so much feedback from the community after publishing it and kind of learning about and thinking through different DMing styles. And I don't know, I mean, if you worked with a developmental editor and then a copy editor and then a proofreader, I'm sure that play testers they would help and... You, and play testers, I'm sure that they would help you work through all of those things. But there's also going to be, there are going to be blind spots for you as a creator, but that's not, that's not the end of the world. Somebody's going to have trouble at one part of your adventure and you can revise based on that person's feedback because there are going to be DMs with vastly different styles. So for me, I tend to, I can stick with the kind of the setup of the adventure to a point and then I have to abandon it because then I feel trapped. Whereas other people, like a friend of mine, her DMing style is she follows by the rules kind of regardless of what they say, like this is how she's going to run the adventure because this is what's written down. It's going to be difficult for you to design for the two of us, right? Like there's going to have to be some sort of happy medium that, that you had as a designer. And some of that I think comes by just just trying things out. And so if you're on the fence about 
publishing on DMs Guild. I think it's an amazing, accepting, really kind community. And so try it. And then, and, and you can always kind of update and revise from there. Yeah. I've, my favorite part about Dungeon Masters Guild is, I mean, DMs Guild is many things. It's a marketplace. It's a license. My favorite part of it is that it really is a community. Um, and uh, I love that you all mentioned it's not just a community of designers, which it very much is. And they love they love new designers joining and they want to help you so much. Um, that's one of my favorite aspects of the cult- our community culture. Uh, but it's also the customers. They're very much a part of the community as well. And um, I've seen it a lot for player options. They'll go back into onto the discussion pages of products and talk about their experience playtesting a player option, but adventures and stuff too. They'll give feedback and um, it's sort of like um, being able to post an adventure's early access uh, and getting feedback on it and then being able to adjust it. And then everyone who's purchased it before gets that updated version uh, mm-hmm. as well. Um, another qu- uh, question that I have, and I, I don't know the answer to this, is I know for for solo D&D, there's a, a few places where there's really strong communities for solo D&D writers to support each other. Uh, I believe there's a Facebook group um, where they really like to gather. Um, is there that a community for duet adventures? I've noticed more and more popping up last year, uh, more duet ed- writers. If there is one, we don't know about it. Um <laughs> I think that'd be really Invite cool us. for there to be one. Yeah, let us know. We want to hang out. Um, <laughs> I would love for there to be one, especially you all have so many wisdoms. I can just imagine if a bunch of people brought their collective wisdoms together. Um, that would be amazing. Um, so totally support that. If someone knows of a community like that, I would also love to hear about it. Um, all right. So, uh, it is our last few minutes. So I think we will go ahead and do some outros. Although if there was a last piece of advice you didn't get to feel free to include that in your outro as well. Um, let us know where folks can find you, um, any products you want to plug, uh, go wild. Um, we will start with Jonathan. Okay. Um, so you can check out, uh, me and Beth's work over on dndduet.com where we write uh, adventures and advice for creating a world just for two. Um, we've got a little store over there uh, where adventures are also on drive through RPG and it also connects to our DMs Guild stuff where you can pick up the Crystal and Curse trilogy. Uh, it's pay what you want on DMs Guild and very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, we talked about First Blush a lot. Um, and that's the first entry in the Crystal and Curse trilogy. Um, let's see. Follow us on Twitter at DD Duet. And I will try to tweet more. <laughs> and I'll throw it over to Beth. <laughs> um, so you can also follow us on Instagram at DD Duet. Basically, all our things Twitch, DD Duet. If you've got those, those seven letters, you're set. Um, let's see. Our. In addition to the Crystal and Curse trilogy, we have a few adventures that sometimes can come sequentially after that. Some of them are more independent. Um, Totems of the Spalish Woods is one of my favorites if you are running a, a Strahd campaign. And um, Feywild Foray is coming soon. I promise I'm working on it. So when that is here, we'll be like, woohoo. Um, if I can plug a non like adventure thing, I yeah. also write fantasy novels and you can find those at bethlawbooks.com. Um, and our duet, well, our duet adventures, like all the writing we did for our D&D campaign kind of inspired, um, I, I recognized how much stuff I had basically. And so then I started writing novels after that. So like, if I can write all of these things, then I can write this. And it, it's been such a cool journey, but I don't know the whole experience of creating D&D duet, of writing and publishing on DMs Guild, of being part of the community has taken us to places I never, never would have imagined. And especially so much faster than I could have imagined. Like I started writing for our little conglomeration of things full time in June of this past year. And that's been like a dream come true for my whole life. And then it just, here we are. 
Hooray. Um, and I appreciate both of you uh, coming on. Thank you for making time, uh, especially with everything you have going on weather-wise, uh, where you are, uh, to talk D&D duets with us. I am Lisa Prenrose. I'm the brand manager for Dungeon Masters Guild. You can follow DMs Guild at DMs underscore guild on Twitter or Instagram. And you can follow me pretty much everywhere at Lisa Penrose. Um, I play, uh, I won't plug my own stuff, but I will plug another duet adventure. Um, I've played a bunch of Jonathan and Beth's work with my husband uh, because they're just really, really fun. And like I said, um, I like their writing style that uh, it's, it gives me enough threads to work with as a dungeon master, but is succinct enough that it's not too much prep. Um, I think probably my favorite of the ones we've played uh, is, um, I should have looked up the name beforehand. I think it's called Prison of the Light Eater. Um, is that on drive through or is it just on dndduet.com? It's on drive-thru. Okay, so uh, go check that out on drive-thru RPG or dndduet.com. I like that one because it's an interesting, um, there's an interesting dungeon and the consequences of that adventure are really epic uh, uh, at scale. So uh, a really epic scale. So if you're going to check out one, I would probably actually recommend First Blush. But uh, if you were going to check out another one, Prison of the Light Eater uh, was super fun for me and me and my Dusty Buns. Um, thank you so much for joining us for your lunch break here on One Bookshelf. Uh, next week at 10 a.m. Pacific time, same day, Thursday, I will be doing a story time with Drive Through Fiction, uh, reading from uh, Storytelling Collective's Flashbang Anthology to celebrate their Flash uh, Fic February. Uh, so we will see you all then um, in until next time uh, may your dice roll in your favor bye everybody bye